Hello, this is Rabbi Ed Bernstein, and uh, I have the great pleasure of being here at the United Synagogue Convention in Baltimore, Maryland, and sitting with me is uh, one of the uh, great rabbis and lecturers and thinkers in American Judaism today, Rabbi Harold Kushner. Um, Rabbi Kushner will be coming to Temple Torah on January 15th, and uh, uh, Rabbi Kushner, it's just such an honor to sit with you today. Well, thank you. Uh, I hardly believe I merit all that praise, but please keep it on. <laughs> so, uh, 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 often the, the tagline associated with your name is Rabbi Harold Kushner, author of When Bad Things Happen to Good People. And I am inordinately you, proud of that. Yeah. So, can you just... Briefly, I know there's a very powerful personal story behind it, but what, can you sum up the story behind that important book that really affected so many people? The real question was not how I came to write the book. The real question is how did I come to the ideas that I tell in the book. That is the, uh, the idea that when unfair things strike somebody in this world, it's not God's doing. God is not testing us. God is not punishing us. Uh, we don't have to blame ourselves for deserving it. I had to come to that conclusion. I, I was raised with the traditional idea of God. I was ordained with the traditional idea of God, except for one teacher, Mordecai Kaplan, who gave us an alternative. And then, when my wife and I had just been married a few years and we had one child, we discovered he had a very grave medical condition. It's one of the rarest diseases in the world. It's called progeria. At any one time, there may be only 100 people in the world afflicted with it. It's the rapid aging syndrome. A little child stops growing and starts growing old when he's three years old. His hair falls out, he gets thin, his bones are brittle, and typically he will die of a heart attack in his early to mid-teens. That was a very hard thing for us to accept. I mean, here was this innocent, bright, wonderful child, born to probably the two most religiously observant people in our community, and he was afflicted by this. I did not know if I could go on urging people to be religious, urging people to pray, urging people to have faith in God, to turn to God, if I thought God was responsible for my son's grave illness. But I didn't want to give up on God. So I came to the conclusion that as succinctly as I can put it, if I have to choose between an all-powerful God who is not kind and fair, or else a kind and fair God who is not all-powerful, which is the more religiously admirable alternative? Where did we ever get trapped into believing that power is the ultimate virtue? Maybe, maybe in the Middle Ages, when you measure the greatness of a ruler by how large an army he had, how large a territory he had, maybe then he could worship power. But in today's world, where did it ever, I, where did the idea ever come from that we are flattering God by saying he's responsible for the Holocaust, he's responsible for earthquakes, he's responsible for, can, for cancer. Now, come to shul and pray to that God. It doesn't work. People are angry at God, and I wanted to spare them from that, not for God's sake. God will be fine. God will be fine whether we prayed it or not. But for people's sakes, I did not want them to be bereft of their faith in God. I didn't want to. I wanted to believe in a God I could turn to to help me through this crisis. So that was a book that uh, has been on the New York Times bestseller list and has touched many lives. And yet there was a book that you wrote before that. Um, and book before the, the personal crisis that you had, and that was when children ask about God. We at Temple Toro, we have we're having a number of uh, parent workshops uh, in which we're reading this book and and uh, reflecting on it. So, it, as you as you reflect on your first book and your life's work since then, what are key points of advice that you would have to today's parents in speaking to their children about God? Somebody once 
phrased it very succinctly, don't plant weeds. Don't teach your children religious ideas that you have in mind to unteach three or four years later. You just confuse them and, and make it hard for them to take you seriously. I think it's possible to put some sophisticated religious ideas into terms that children can understand. And maybe the basic idea, maybe the cornerstone of my entire theology, God is not there to do things for you. God is there to make it possible for you to do things for yourself. Things that you think are too hard, whether it's learning to tie your shoelaces or learning long division or coming to terms with a tragedy. You think you're not capable of it, and then, wondrously, miraculously, you find within yourself qualities of strength and faith and knowledge and wisdom that you did not know you had. And that is the most wonderful experience of all. Uh, some years ago, I was invited to pay a guest lecture to my daughter's day school, my granddaughter's day school class in Boston, Solomon Schechter School. And I suggest to them, the question is not, where is God, or who is God? The real question is, when is God? When is God? What has to be happening for you to feel you're in God's presence? And I gave them some examples. You've done something naughty, you broke something, you told a lie, and you try to cover up for it. The truth comes out. Your parents say, come on in, we have to talk about this. You expect the worst. They don't scold you. They say, we really expect more of you. We hope that you've learned your lesson. You walk out and you feel that wonderful sense of having been forgiven. Where did that sense of being forgiven, where did the capacity of your parents to forgive you come from? It came from God, who is Hanun Hamad El Islamach, who is ready to dispense the gift of forgiveness. You have to do something which is challenging, a homework assignment, and you don't think you can do it. You sit down, you try, and you do it real well. This is God not doing the work for you. This is God, Chonen Hadad, giving you the intelligence to do something you didn't know you were capable of doing. You're sick, you've got a cold, you've got the flu, you feel miserable, you can't play, you can't watch TV. And then finally one morning you wake up and you feel healthy again. It is so liberating, you have met God. That's one of those moments in which God is Rofei Choleam of Israel. God heals the sick among his people. The question is not what does God spend his time doing. The question is what are the moments in which God's presence becomes so palpably real that if we would just be awake to it, it would be a profound religious experience. Okay. Okay. So one more question, and that is, um, you've written many books since uh, When Bad Things Happen to Good People. Uh, one book that touched me in a, in a very personal way was uh, your book, Living a Life That Matters. Yes. And uh, I noticed you, you wrote, uh, I think it was an afterword, that you sent the book off to the publisher just days before 9-11. And uh, and the world just changed dramatically. And it's changed dramatically in so many ways since then, the technology we use and so forth. So uh, in anticipating a, a conversation with Temple Torah about um, living a meaningful life, what, what, are, what are key things that you plan to discuss in January on how we can live a meaningful life today given all of the complexities in our world? Well, I'm going to speak to your congregation at several levels. One, for the younger people raising families. What can you do to feel good about what you will be leaving behind? For the older people, how can you look back at your life and feel a real sense of satisfaction in the difference you made? The key to the book is that one of the things people need, as much as they need food and affection and a place to live, is a sense of significance. We are scared to death of anonymity. We can't handle the idea that we'll be born, live, and die, and it's like throwing a stone into the water, the ripples for a second, and then the water comes back and the stone is gone. I want to be able to tell people whether you're young or old, 
whether you're famous or uh, ordinary, whether you're successful in business or less successful, you have made a difference in the world. And I want to show you how you have done it. And for those of you who have a lot of your life ahead of you, I want to show you how you can do it from this day forward, so you can look back and feel a real sense of satisfaction. Oh, that is uh, something to look forward to, some wisdom that uh, I look forward to studying with you, with our congregation further in January. Rabbi Harold Kushner, it's really a pleasure, and uh, I look forward to seeing you in Boynton Beach in January. I will look forward to it as well, Rabbi. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.